Hi, I'm Flip Nicklin. Welcome to Humpback Chronicles. Our special guest this week is best-selling author Christopher Moore. And we get to talk about how our whale science got involved with fiction. I first got involved with uh, whales as a photojournalist telling stories about whales. Most of these stories were originally shot for National Geographic magazine, though they were published a number of other places. Too. Starting working with Jim 20 years ago when he came back to Maui, the main goal was doing peer-reviewed science. That said, also was telling the story, and we were used to that, whether it was magazines or books or working with documentary films. So it was really something new to us when Christopher Moore approached us to do a book that was fiction. Not just fiction, but humorous fiction. Hi, Chris. Hi, Flip. Uh, my first question is, what brought you to Maui? How did uh, a, a, a kid from Ohio end up coming to uh, work with where researchers in Maui? I had a friend who was a waterman. One of these guys that, you know, anybody from Hawaii knows what that is. A guy that spends all his time in the water, does all the water activities. And he had been to the island of Rarutu and been in the water with singing whales. And over lunch one day, he described it to me. And it was a life-changing thing for him. He said he had a friend who was a whale researcher named Randy Wells. And um, he might be able to help me. Because I knew that to get near whales in um, U.S. waters you had to be on a research permit or you had to be working with researchers. So I sent a letter off to Randy Wells with this pile of five books that I'd written up to that point to show that I was legitimate. And I said, I want to do a book about humpback whales. Here's my books. What do you think? And he said, um, I only work with bottlenose dolphins, but I went to school with a guy named Jim Darling who knows more about humpback whales than anybody in the world. And this is his email. And so I got another pile of books and I sent them off to Jim Darling. And he said, our uh, research begins in December, send your information and we'll put you on the, on the research permit. So that was how I got to Maui. You know, people are coming all the time and they have some realistic, some not realistic ideas of what's going to go on. And uh, I do remember the book you sent, which mm -hmm. was Island of the Sequin Love Nun. Mm -hmm. which was uh, with a very lurid cover, and uh, it may not have helped the cause immediately, but you, you did everything right. You came, you waited, you weren't a pain in the, the back end, and, uh, and, and you were really nice to work with, and you'd done your research. You knew what you wanted to say, and you wanted to tell the story. I knew I was on double secret probation. I, I went back to my wife that night after the first night out and I went, oh, I'm on double secret probation. I don't know how long this will last. But at one point, uh, they were doing uh, identification photos, tail, uh, tail identification photos. And I actually, part of my unfinished academic work was uh, I studied photography. And so, you know, they could hand me a Nikon, at that time a film Nikon, uh, with a 300 millimeter lens and I was moderately useful, you know? <laughs> so I got on, I think the only, only secret probation, not double secret probation. Well, uh, uh, second question. And that is uh, how did working uh, with research and with real whales change your ideas from what you came in with, what you uh, expected things to be like? Um, I think the, the difference, the, my biggest change in perception was not with whales, but with the people who worked on whales. When I showed up, I was going to write a book about whales. And by the end of the first day out on the boat, I was, I had decided I'm going to write a book about people who study whales because it was so interesting. And um, the, the being in the proximity to an animal that size, that loud, you know, because we were recording singers that day. Is, is so viscerally exciting. There's this rise in your chest of excitement that I, I can't, I don't know, even though I put words together for a living, I don't know that I can describe it. And, and that's something that I kind of endeavored to do um, when I wrote the book. Um, 
my perceptions of whales, what was great is during the process of which a lot was waiting, um, I knew, I think going in that humpbacks, you know, they didn't feed in Hawaii. No one had ever seen them mate. At that point, no one had seen them calf. Um, and so we sort of went through that and Jim sort of was kind enough to explain what they were doing and, and, and trying to study the behavior and the difficulty of the behavior on, on that scale on an animal that's talking to someone, some, another animal that's miles apart and, and how that affects behavior. And, um, and at the end of the day, as we were going in, Jim looks at me and he goes, so why do they sing, Chris? And it was obvious to me that this was a guy who had spent his whole life trying to answer that question. And he would have been completely happy if the novice on the boat went, it's like this. And, uh, and I remember I said to him, well, if it's not food or sex, Jim, it's art or religion. <laughs> and, and then he looked at me like, you are useless. And <laughs> we went to the rest of the way. The biggest perception that was changed, or, or maybe I was enlightened to because I didn't have any preconceived notions, was just how passionate the people were who were doing this work were and how engaged they were even after years and on a daily basis. Um, it, was, uh, it was fascinating that we would go out and we would observe behavior and Megan and Jim would talk about what that meant all the way back to Lahaina. You know, what did we see mean today on an evolutionary scale, on a scale of tens of millions of years? What did we see mean today? And later on, I would have dinner with Jim and ask him, you know, what's the best thing about what you do? And he said, when you go out there and you see something that no one has seen before ever, and it's never been published, that's what you have as you're coming in, you know something that no one else in the world has ever known. And it, there was just such a light in his eyes when he said it and such a truth to it. And I thought, I got this has got to be a book. You know, this has got to be about people who do this. Uh, everywhere we go, people tell us whale stories. Some are more grounded in reality than others. Do you have a, a memorable whale story from that first trip? Uh, I think from the first trip, uh, the I have two because I always like to over overindulge. the The first was the very first day when we found a singer, and I saw that there it was, sort of hovering, you know, head down in the water. The tail couldn't have been more than twelve feet under the boat, and you know, so it was crystal clear that this animal was there, and it was singing so loud that the the rails on the boat were vibrating, you know, resonating with it. And Megan was about ready to drop the hydrophone. And she looked over this, my first experience with it, any whale up close. And she goes, good morning, pumpkin. And I just, it was like this 40,000 pound animal. And it just like that went in the book. I think that's the way the book opens um, with one of the researchers calling one of the whales pumpkin. The, the most exciting thing was there's this really big, fat male whale we know he was a male because he sang later um with white completely white pecs like a like a southern uh humpback and he kept coming up behind the boat fast and diving under the boat and so it was as if he could see he wanted you to go look how big i am look because you just see white pecs going by on either side of the boat and and then he'd come up and he'd circle around and come back and do it again and and um it was so exciting. I was just going, you'd run to the back of the boat and you'd run to the front of the boat and he'd they, come through and they did it repeatedly and, and uh, did a couple of tail waves. And it was so exciting. And I just thought, I just, I want to take this whale home and I want to put him in a box with some grass and a little saucer of water, to, you know, like you do when you're a kid. And, um, and I remember Jim saying, he's going to do something. If he jumps, get out of the boat you don't want to be between a whale and the boat. And it was like, wow, that changed my attitude toward this thing really fast. But it was, again, so exciting and so great. And and, th and that whole first year, I was still on double secret probation. So I hadn't been in the water. I didn't get in the water at all. But that was definitely the highlight of the first the first year. 
And then you came back for the second year. And uh, tell us about coming back to the second year and what brought you back. Well, I, I had I had made friends with the researchers with you guys, and um, and so that was exciting, and it was it was just a, a great thing. I I had decided in the interim that it was going to be a book about whale people, and not whales, and I did all the academic reading that I could get my hands on, which happens with any book that you do. You just get into the level where you have to learn a new vocabulary, uh, you know. And I got to that level with with the whale thing, but the behavior part. I didn't completely have down, you know, and, and I don't mean whale behavior. I mean, human behavior. And you guys were so, uh, made such an impression on me. And I think that was part of it. Part of it was there are way worse ways to spend a winter than, you know, being on a research boat in the out out channel, uh, you know, 12 feet above a giant whale that's singing, you know, so that was part of it. But I think a lot of it was, was getting the details of the procedure and the relationships. And I ended up, uh, I ended up not, I, I had never done this before. I had never used a person as a character in the, a real person as a character in a book. I'd done composites. And I, I think I told you guys, I, would do composites. I would take behavior from one character and another. And I did that somewhat, but the two characters of, of uh, Clay and, um, and um, Quinn in that are definitely based on you guys, you know, and, you know, disclaimer aside, there's, and, and there's, there's really distinct differences. Clay is Greek. And uh, I had to explain to your mom about how I killed her off um, in, in the book, you know, cause that was sad, but it was a great, anecdote I had about a Greek guy that I, I made part of your history and Jim wasn't married, you know, and, and, and so forth, because it made it easier for the, uh, for the story to have a love story going on. But uh, personality wise, they were very much how I observed you guys to be and, and Clay swears and you don't, you know, but um, I, I was a little nervous when the book came out and I sent the, the early galleys of the book to you guys. And I was like, well, this isn't exactly what I told him it was going to be. But, you know, to your credit, I was so impressed that I couldn't wash the reality out of my mind. And, and my mother will eventually forgive you for killing her off. <laughs> One of the great things ab about the reaction to the book when it came out was how researchers reacted to it because they didn't just see it. They knew you guys, they knew who you were because they'd seen you at conferences and they'd seen your work over the years, but, um, or they knew you personally, but they saw themselves. They were like, well, this guy got this right. This is exactly what it's like to be out on a, on a research boat, which was a great, um, uh, sort of affirmation for me it was you know it was like well I, I got it right you know except for you know the really insane stuff and I, and to my credit you got a personal submarine in the book which you don't have in real life so as we go along what are, what are the what are the surprises of things that have come along uh, uh continue what what continues to surprise you about whales or what has been interesting lately what are you excited about as you follow the news um i remember specifically we were at the biannual conference on marine mammal science. And we went into one of the presentations, which was a guy who had built a million dollar remote camera to film the rubbing beach where the, where the killer whales go in and rub their skin and slough their skin off on the pebbles. And we walked out of it. We're walking down the hall. And I didn't know you that well at that point. And you said, I didn't know any better. I just got in the water with them. <laughs> <laughs> As a story I tell all the time, it's like, because the guy's whole 15 minutes was about this, this amazing robotic camera that he bought. And that sort of leads to the other surprises, you know, this, the, the, the killer whales and their behavior lately is, you know, with them attacking pleasure boats in the, in the Mediterranean and, and, uh, you know, just through the Straits of Gibraltar, that's an interesting thing to start happening because it looks like coordinated behavior um it, with a enemy <laughs> and, um, it looks like revenge is what is what researchers are saying and uh and bob Pittman's stuff about you know humpback whales protecting you know bottlenose dolphins from you know killer whales and stuff like that and protecting seals you know that sort of anomalous behavior is really interesting What's changed the most uh, is how you collect the data. 
I remember the first, all the years I was out there, the big problem was how do we study these animals from above? You know, a helicopter was six, seven hundred dollars an hour and an hour wasn't enough and, and kites didn't work and blimps didn't work. And, um, you know, but everybody was open to trying that sort of stuff. And of course we were still, my first year we were using digital, we were using film instead of digital. And then you guys went to digital the next year. Um, and now with drones, it's like, you can, you know, order something for a thousand bucks on Amazon and do, <laughs> you know, aerial studies of whales and you see it all the time. Uh, that's been a huge, um, and some of the underwater drones technology has really changed how you guys study it. You know, um, I know the, the 4k and 8k cameras that you guys use now to film them that didn't, nothing like that existed. You know, that's the size of an old Hasselblad and yet you can, you're taking eight K uh, video, you know, I just, uh, it, it, that's what's changed is how you guys collect the, the data. I think. One thing for people to know that this, we're not done. We're just barely beginning. Uh, the pictures of, of birth this year that the whale watchers got with a GoPro, something we never dreamed of. Thank you so much, Chris. And thanks to all of you and the growing uh, Whale Trust family. Have a very happy whale season. And thank you for your support.